share my screen. All right, Chad, this is where you shine. Can you see my, my slideshow? All set. All right. All right, so this evening for our Nikkei treatment planning, and this is not really something that falls under the umbrella of treatment planning, um, but our Monday nights have turned into what's relevant in the world of dentists in Maine and beyond. <clears throat> and I think this particular topic is something that any, any dentist, whether they're a specialist or a general dentist, can uh, gain some understanding about when it comes to local anesthesia and the potential medical emergencies that arise thereafter. <clears throat> Anybody want to take a stab at why I put this here? Other than the fact that I wish it was me. <clears throat> uh, when it comes to what we do, you know, we're afforded the, the title of doctors for a reason. Uh, part of that comes with the fact that there are things that can happen in our world that are rare, um, that might happen once in a career uh, or even less frequently but it's up to us to understand that those odds do exist, no different than the significant odds of this person winning the Powerball. So on this call, we have Dr. Dwayne Tebow with us. He was uh, kind enough to share some of his information. Uh, I'm gonna let him introduce himself once we get to a, um, an organic point. Uh, but he had shared his medical emergency office action plan. Uh, he does <coughs> IV sedation for dentists uh, he's been in our office many times, especially over the past year. Uh, but the point is that every office needs to have a medical off a medical emergency office action plan. Uh, over the past four or five years, I've had the fortunate opportunity to, to visit many different dental offices. Part of that was to learn more about the profession. Part of it was to um, kick the tires on the idea of acquiring practices. Uh, this is not overly common. Um, I really would like to advocate that one of the takeaway messages with this conversation tonight is those that are out there that are not part of Sock River Dentistry, uh, just make sure that you, that you have a rather thorough action plan. This is just page one of um, many things that we need to have some sort of idea, of, uh, some protocol when it comes to taking care of patients. We're going to dive into that as, as time goes on. But let's start with a hypothetical case report. Part of this is somewhat relevant to uh, several of us in the group, um, but I think the point will be well understood as I articulate this uh, hypothetical case report. So a 40-year-old healthy female presents to a dental practice for routine dental care on tooth 19. She reports no changes to her already uneventful medical history. Uh, we would call that patient uh, ASA classification one. Uh, if you're not familiar with ASA classification, I would get familiar with it because it's a nice way to put patients into safety buckets. ASA 1 essentially means they're on no medications and they have no um, systemic uh, issues. ASA 2, I would say most of our adult patients fall into that category because they're on a medication or two and have controlled systemic issues. ASA 3, so on and so forth. ASA 3 is when people start to get an unstable like uncontrolled diabetes or uncontrolled hypertension. 4 is 4, 5, and I believe six is present. Those are th conditions where we're not going to run into those people because they're in the hospital. Uh, but we want to see our ASA ones and twos. Those are the patients that we safely treat. The threes, we should definitely have, um, have involvement with our medical colleagues to make sure that we have all our T's crossed and I's dotted. So I, I think this is a very valuable classification tool. It's one that we use in our sedation workups quite regularly because it's an expectation of sedation. <clears throat> the patient is administered a pretty standard uh, protocol for local anesthesia for tooth 19, two carpules of blah, blah, blah. Everybody knows what I'm talking about there. There were no positive aspirations noted. So this is a pretty standard patient in a general dental practice each and every day. But the patient starts to begin to feel palpitations. We've all had that. I think that most of us handle it pretty well. With that said, it is a wrench in the wheels and it's something that if we can avoid, we should try to avoid it, but we should also know how to handle it if and when it happens. But 10 minutes later, the patient begins to show signs of syncope. Uh, so we can say this is going to make for an interesting day. All right, so that's the hypothetical case report. So what should we do? Well, let's start with some questions. 
did we properly assess the patient's medical history to make sure that we adequately treated this patient with the local anesthetic? Was our technique sufficient? Is the aspiration technique in local anesthesia administration an absolute tool for mitigation of risk? What are palpitations and are they serious? What actions should we take when this happens? When should we activate EMS? And what else can we do to prevent this from happening? So these questions I hope to elucidate some understanding on today. Um, I see this being the beginning of a series of medical emergency conversations. Uh, Duane has offered to, to be part of this. Um, there's several oral surgery colleagues that have expressed interest in being part of just helping dentists treat patients more safely. But for this conversation, we're gonna focus on this particular case report and look at these questions moving forward. So let's look at the first question. What should we do? Did we properly assess the patient's medical history? Do we solely re rely on the signed medical history? I will be the first to admit that I've done this many times. The patient signed it, therefore it's accurate. Only to ask more poignant questions and then we find out that, oh, by the way, I visited a cardiologist last week and I have AFib. You know, these, these things do happen all the time we have to be an active participant when it comes to uh, acquisition of the medical history. Very obvious, but I can promise you this is not done each and every day. What additional questions should we ask? Are, do we do a review, review of systems? Do we ask specific cardiac questions since those tend to be the, the things that are most relevant when it comes to local anesthesia, especially when we're using uh, epinephrine? How should we categorize our patients? Are they high risk or low risk? That's where the ASA classification comes in, comes in handy. So for the ASA two and three patients, should we get medical consultation for high risk conditions? And what other clues can we have to provide the safest experience for our patients? So these are, these are questions that help us assess the likelihood that the patient can go <clears throat> into uh, a situation that might require activation of EMS. Was our technique sufficient? So how accurate are we with local anesthesia methods? <clears throat> There's a high degree of <clears throat> efficacy when it comes to our ability to administer local anesthesia. Uh, as somebody who's gotten to work with many dentists, some extremely uh, tenured in their career, others right out of school, uh, and I myself having practiced 15 years, there's quite a wide range. There's a bell curve of um, uh, capacities when it comes to how accurate are we with our local anesthesia met methods, specifically the IAN, which is definitely the most difficult of, of them all. Uh, when was the last time we reviewed Malamed's text? I can't live without that. I've had it you know, front and center for me. For those who don't know what the Malamed text is, it's the preeminent handbook of local anesthesia for, den for dentistry. Uh, if you don't have a copy of it handy, I highly recommend you do. If you haven't, taken a look at it somewhat recently, I would definitely recommend you do so. Um, every time I read it, I learn something new. It's like watching a funny movie. You get a, you know, a joke or two that you didn't see before. It's worth going through all of those things. Are the needles we use best suited for patient safety? We'll talk about that. Have we hit bone to assure we are where we think we are? Again, I, I, I'm paraphrasing this conversation or I'm focus, focusing this conversation around the inferior alveolar nerve block because that's the one that has the highest risk of, of having uh, unfortunate side effects <clears throat> when administ administering local anesthesia. Uh, did we consider lowering inflammation or buffering to increase local anesthetic effectiveness? Uh, I got a phone call from one of our doctors today who uh, was at carpule number seven for a number 30 extraction, um, had a hard time getting the patient numb. It was one of those patients who hadn't been in the practice or at you know, at a dental office for maybe 20, 30 years, those people live rather inflammatory lives. In other words, their the pH of their body is <clears throat> is rather low. Those patients are harder to get numb, so we're more likely to have to inject many times. Well, each time we go in there, we're inc increasing the risk for something to happen. So the point of this here is if we can get really good at making sure we only need one or two carpules of anesthetic, we've in essence lowered our risk. And did we aspirate 
appropriately. And we'll look at that. So here we have a pretty standard set of uh, photos to have a conversation about what's going on anatomically. First and foremost, the number one thing I see, dentists and hygienists giving local, they still hit this. They're only halfway in and they're injecting the whole carpule. I mean, it's just amazing. And I know I used to do it too, in great part because we're relying on the soft tissue landmarks that we were taught in school to guide us. Well, that's only the starting point. The soft tissue landmarks, you know, we have the pterygo mandibular raffae, which gives us an approximation of where to go. But once we hit bone, that information supersedes where we went in. So if you hit bone, too soon, you need to reapproximate. I mean, I can appreciate that some of this is rather rudimentary, but these are mistakes I see day in and day out uh, by, by dentists, including myself. Well, what if we go too far back? You know, what happens over here? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so this picture here, let's keep it in our mind's eye. Let's always remember this internal oblique ridge. If we hit bone and we're only halfway, th halfway to the hub with our long needle, we most likely hit this. It makes a difference. Now, what do we do? Everybody knows what to do from that point forward. If you don't, please see Malamed's textbook. He has a really good explanation of what to do if you hit that early. There it is. Um, this is the copy that I have. Uh, I believe he has more updated copies. It's a very good uh, soup to nuts discussion on local anesthesia in dentistry. He makes a very valid point and we have doctors in our practices from many different universities. Let me just say that this needle here should be the workhorse for the inferior alveolar nerve block. I've seen many doctors use this and I've seen many doctors use this. The reason why this needle is, in my opinion, and this opinion is in accordance with what Malamed said, uh, patients don't feel the increase in diameter. So this is a 25 gauge, this is a 27, and they're the same length. The perception is that bigger is gonna hurt more. That's been studied and that's not true if you use proper techniques. But there's something about this that doesn't happen as much as this. Anybody wanna take a, take a stab at what that is? Because I need a sip of water and I wanna see if anybody's paying attention. Is it, um, is it harder to tell if you're in a uh, blood vessel, if you have a small diameter needle? Uh, I like that point, and that is something I read in the literature today as I, <clears throat> I dove pretty deep into aspirations and whether aspirations are really that relevant or not, and I, I'll share why I had concern or questions there. Um, that topic wasn't covered, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of it. So it's a larger lumen within the, the needle itself. Therefore, would it be easier to have a positive aspiration to assess whether you're in there? Um, the th relevant loop, not sure how relevant, but the thing I was looking for is deflection. So the stiffer 25 gauge doesn't deflect as much, which gives us more control to try to get to where we're trying to go. I, I'm aware of deflection because of what I read in the Malamed book. I cannot use this needle. It, it just, I can feel it going away from where I want it to go. I have no idea where this needle is going. Some people it's easy, other people it's hard. You know, those patients who have very stiff musculature and you're trying to push hard, that needle through there, you're gonna get deflection. That needle is very flimsy in comparison to this one. So the reason why I like the 25 long needle, the red, is because one, that's what I was taught, but it was emphasized in, in Malamed's book that patients don't really feel a pain difference between the two, so what's the advantage of using this, especially considering this has much less deflection. If we have less deflection, we have more accuracy, and hopefully some of these untoward events that we're gonna talk about later on are not realized. Um, I don't understand that there's a technique out there that involves this needle here. Um, I'm not, a, not qualified to opine on that, I just know the standard of care is to use this needle. Not to mention, you don't want to bury the hub in case the needle ever detaches. Never heard of it happening, but it is a concern. So this is it right here. So how does this happen? You know, we, I think we've all had patients that have had some sort of facial paralysis or 
uh, facial effect when we're giving these blocks. This is a really good diagram here, and the point is that if we're not if we're not using a stiff needle, we're likely to have deflection. We're much more likely to end up in the parotid gland. We all remember from anatomy that what's in the parotid gland? The facial nerve. Well, the parotid gland can sometimes exist in an area that's not too far away from the distal border of the mandible. So it really is in our best interest to make sure that we have a technique that involves contacting bone. And we really should contact bone where the, when the needle contacts bone, we are two-thirds to three-quarters to the hub. Sometimes seven-eighths, uh, depending on the anatomy of the person. But the point is the bone is our, is our um, the tool that we use to determine whether or not we were too far. So this is uh, ischemia. This is what happens if you inadvertently inject into a blood vessel. This was a uh, case report uh, of, a, pa of a, um, a doctor who injected it inadvertently into the facial artery. Uh, that anesthetic had some, some epinephrine in it. That epinephrine basically caused vasoconstriction of all of the downstream blood vessels. Fortunately, it was, it was limiting, self-limiting. Uh, there were some things that they talked about here, but I do want to go over what this article talked about. What happens when we inject inside of a blood vessel? I'll be honest, I, I wasn't aware of this. If, if I did have this information in my noggin once upon a time, it, it, it escaped me. Uh, but what he talked about here is that patients will report a sharp, intense, electrical, acute, painful sensation. I, I, my understanding was we're injecting near a nerve, and that's why they felt that. But this particular article, and it was corroborated with other uh, articles that I read today, uh, that this is the sensation that happens when we inject inside of a blood vessel. Immediate facial pallor was observed in, uh, involving the cheek, the angle of the mouth, so on and so forth. Uh, this lasted for about 10 minutes. There were a few other case reports. They talked about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I see this a lot when I do uh, infiltrations around the infraorbital nerve, kind of in this area. Uh, I'll see a little bit of white patchiness. Essentially, I, I must have injected into a small needle where I didn't have a positive aspiration. The good news is this is uh, something that will resolve uh, completely by the end of the dental procedure. So this was their conclusion. Reassurance that this complication is self-limiting, li reversible, and carries no long-term effects. Uh, this is important for calming the patient and the dental health care provider as we can see the patient result here. So we're starting to talk about things that can happen uh, when local anesthesia doesn't go the way we planned. I put this article or this picture here. Uh, we're not gonna dive into trismus, but I just wanted to show some of the muscles that are present here. Uh, here they show it almost like there's a nice passageway, although there's some truth to that. I think we all know that sometimes we go through those muscles, especially the, uh, the patients that are Bruxers Sometimes you can't even get through the muscle, it's so, so dense. Um, but there is a conversation about trismus that occurs due to local anesthesia, uh, topic for another day, but something uh, related to the conversation tonight. Uh, I just wanted to throw this in here, a little bit of a histology diagram to show what the different layers of tissue are. And the reason why I think this is important, um, I have a technique that came from the world of my, uh, from my maxi course training, where when we do full flaps, full mucoperiosteal flaps, there was a technique where you inject into the space just above the periosteum, or actually between the periosteum and the bone, something like this. And <clears throat> I can't say for sure exactly where it came from, but the concept of uh, injecting under the periosteum assures you're going to be away from the vascular nature of the mucosa. I started doing this for my IANs. I know we're all taught to contact bone and then withdraw a millimeter, but I can tell you there might be some validity to injecting on the periosteum and then the fluid flows along to the mandibular canal where the nerve trunk is and you get much more direct access of the local anesthetic to the nerve trunk itself without running the risk of having a positive aspiration. As we're gonna see shortly, positive aspirations are not always present 
there's a high degree of false negatives there. So this particular technique is something I'm currently working out. If you decide to do it, do it at your own risk. I've been doing it for years and I typically only use one carpule of lidocaine every time I do an IAN. Uh, so I do feel very safe with this technique, but it's not, I have not seen that in the literature. I've not seen it in a textbook. Uh, it came somewhere in my training. I don't remember where, so proceed with caution. But it is a concept that I think might be uh, worth kicking the tires on as you get better and better at these blocks. Understanding that when you contact bone, just inject right there. If you want to do uh, aspiration, that's fine. I've never had a positive aspiration when I do that because I'm underneath the periosteum. Does anybody do this with IANs? I, um, <clears throat> you've talked to me about it before. I've tried to do it that way and sometimes it works well. I've had other times and if anyone else has done it, um, we try to inject, it's a little tougher on some people. doesn't want to just go. So I do pull back in that case. So I don't over force the anesthetic and, you know, surprise right. somebody. Right. Yeah. I mean, we use that technique all over the mandible when we're doing <clears throat> full flaps because it, creates a hydrostatic pressure, which causes the periosteum to lift off. Uh, it just makes reflection far easier. I've never had a problem with it. And it's a well-known it's a well you, well known and well-established technique in the oral surgery world for that purpose, but not necessarily for IANs. So I just wanted to share that here, that understanding the anatomy and trying to get away from the vascular areas of the, of the tissue is really our goal. All right, so is aspiration technique an absolute tool for mitigation of risk? What is the false negative rate for aspiration with local anesthesia? Is aspiration needed everywhere? How often should we aspirate? How do we know if we aspirate it appropriately? So there's a lot of articles that go into this. Um, the standard of care is to aspirate, and it's standard of care to aspirate many times. Uh, this, this actually is the article I showed you with the, uh, the facial ischemia. I'm going to skip over that. Uh, but this, this article here made a very significant point, and it, it's echoed throughout the literature that uh, we're not going to get positive aspirations even if we're in the blood vessel sometimes. So according to Meachin, who seemed to pop up in this world of aspiration quite a bit, slight pressure should be applied on aspiration applied on aspirating in order to prevent occlusion of the blood vein by the lumen of the needle, or even the rupture of small veins by excessive force of aspirating, resulting respectively in false negative and false positive readings. The point is, if you don't have a positive aspiration, you can't say with confidence that you weren't in a blood vessel. That's rather significant. Let's skip that. For the sake of time, so more literature here. Uh, in the Malabed text, he talks about the frequency of positive aspirations being somewhere between 5 and 20% um, of significant note. The Gau Gates, which is an alternative to the inferior alveolar nerve block, uh, has a positive aspiration rate of 2%. Another reason why the Gau Gates is a good idea to have in your, in your arsenal. Uh, this one here, aspirate before injecting the local anesthetic. Is it necessary? Uh, here he was talking about the fact that um, injecting the local anesthetic, so not the epinephrine, but the local anesthetic can cause systemic issues such as seizure, something we want to be very cognizant of. Uh, this was an article from the um, Journal of Oral Maxillofacial, let's see, Jomi. Yeah, anyways, it's an oral surgery journal, one, one of their better ones. And they interviewed or uh, polled dentists and mass or oral surgeons in Massachusetts and found when do you have these um, adverse events? Syncope was pretty high. That, that was the most common thing that happened with local anesthetics. So this is the column that we're looking at right here, just local anesthesia. Convulsion, 18. Again, this is an N of 181,000. So these are pretty rare events but they can happen. 
Now, if they happen to somebody that has the training an oral surgeon has, they can probably navigate that with a high degree of confidence. What we want to do is to try to have um, an algorithm for general dentists that maybe don't have that kind of training. How do we deal with these if and when they happen? Do we call EMS immediately when a patient starts to, to seize or if they start to have hypertension, so on and so forth? We should have a very clear set of guidelines that guide us down these, these paths as they arise. So these are some sequelae of inadvertent intravascular injection of local anesthetic, palpitations, syncope, agitation, just to name a few. Uh, this is that uh, <clears throat> oral surgeon from, uh, from Britain who talked his whole career in academia. He was looking at local anesthetics, specifically aspirations. And he talked about the fact that these studies demonstrated, so he did a, a somewhat of a meta-analysis review on this particular topic that the forces required to move the cartridge plunger, meaning you're, you're pulling back, you know, will that, will that car cartridge plunger actually move backwards to cause uh, the effect within the solution that actually give you a positive aspiration. It varied between cartridges supplied by the same manufacturer, and that force required for aspiration could be less than that needed to inject solution leading to aspiration failure. Basically, he's saying that it's very easy to screw up the aspiration method. So then he went on to say how much force is actually required for aspiration and this diagram gives us some guidance on what that force should be. So here we have time uh, and then we have force. This is the, uh, the amount of force that we would use when we we're first injecting. And then we, you know, once we're actually injecting the fluid, we, we come back and we have what, what he calls a maintenance force. That maintenance force is the force required to give a <clears throat> steady amount, steady, steady quantity of local anesthetic into the tissue. Well, that's the amount of tissue, uh, amount of pressure that we should have when we give back pressure uh, when we do aspiration. If we go too hard, sometimes we have a positive aspiration. And if we go really hard, we never have a positive aspiration. The point is, you can pull too hard back on the plunger. Very sim simple observation that might have very significant effects for your patients or our patients. And then he also went on to say, uh, dental adrenaline, epinephrine is injected extravascularly. So this is a situation where the local anesthetic is not injected into the blood vessel itself. Uh, has been shown that entry into the circulation is rapid. So what's the point here? we might actually have patients with these side effects even if we weren't in the blood vessel itself uh, with the peak dose occurring around eight minutes post-injection. All right, so we just went over a lot. What are palpitations and are they serious? But before we go into this, because this is where I want to bring Duane in. Duane, would you like to introduce yourself? You're a man of many words, so I don't think I need to uh, introduce <laughs> you. Sure, thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Duane Thibault. I'm a nurse anesthesiologist uh, here in the state of New Hampshire, and I provide, along with uh, my partner, anesthesia in dental offices um, in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Mass. Um, I've been providing solely dental anesthesia in dental offices since 2015, late 2015, early 16. Um, we do pediatrics and adults every day of the week. Um, background on me is i er nurse for nearly 20 years uh, critical care ground and flight uh, florida hospital south uh, so we'd go out and pick up the sickest of the sick me and another paramedic and either fly them back or bring them back via uh, via ambulance based on the weather i also was a paramedic for daytona beach fire department so any overdoses anything you name it we've we've I've done it um and then i uh, went to anesthesia school and uh down in florida but um, that's kind of my background. Um, and uh, thankfully, uh, Nick here and uh, Zach have allowed me the opportunity to uh, provide anesthesia um, for them uh, at their practice um, on some of their bigger cases, which I think um, as we get more and more into it, everybody's, everybody's learning a little something uh, uh, every day. So it's nice to be able to work with these guys. Yeah. Dwayne, it's been great. And I, I definitely will put a plug in for you as we move forward. <clears throat> Essentially, what Duane offers is IV sedation 
you know, he's getting the patients much more deeply sedated than Zach and I can do with uh, oral sedation alone. Um, Cannot recommend highly enough. <laughs> One of the greatest days of my month is when I know Dwayne's coming. <laughs> Cannot recommend. As Zach says, it, you, it's, like, it's like working on a type of <laughs> This is the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what Dwayne brings is not only sedation, but also the, his strong background in medical emergencies. And that's why I wanted to, to circle him in. So let's hop back over here. And Dwayne, if you just want to chat when, when the time is right. Um, sure. You know, what are palpitations? I, Go ahead. I do have one question for you guys. Um, so there are different types of needles out there, and I've never truly, honestly looked at your needles um, that you guys use in dental. Um, the needles that we use in medicine that we do give our injections with, or we start with IVs and whatnot, they're cutting needles. Are they the same um, cutting needle uh, type um, yes. that you guys give injections with? Okay. Yep. 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 All right. That was just one of my questions because I see I see a lot of times like when we would when we inject. Um, in the hospital or whatnot. And I've seen this in other areas of the medical field, um, especially with cutting needles, they'll go in, they'll inject a little bit, aspirate a little bit, and then they don't find it's the right spot. So they actually take the needle, they don't pull it back out. They actually leave it where it's at and then tilt it and then go farther. And I don't think a lot of times people understand what's happening with the tip of that needle um, and, the, and the repercussions that we can find ourselves in because of that. Because actually what you're doing, if you don't come all the way back out and then reposition it and go back in, you're literally cutting that tissue as you turn and go forward. Now, cutting that tissue can cut vessels that can allow uh, local anesthetic th you know, to, to, to leak into them. And part of the reason I bring this up is because when we learned to do epidurals, that was a big thing when we learned to do epidurals. And I know this is totally different. But just remember, just a point that I would point out is that you got a cutting needle. Just be, you know, remember when you pull back, and it's not where you want to be, come back out and then go back in and aim where you want to go because you are cutting tissue back there. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful, Dwayne. And that, that is a recommendation in the local anesthesia world for dentistry. Uh, and I know for a fact it's not followed all, all of the time. So that's a, that's a beautiful point. <clears throat> and for those who don't know what he means by cutting needle, <clears throat> uh, I would encourage you to go understand what the difference is. Um, you know, essentially it, it's able to cut uh, in more dimensions than just the pointy tip. Uh, no different than uh, suture needles or, you know, they have that, that variety too. Anything else, Dwayne, from what we talked about so far? No, thank you. Yep. All right. So what are palpitations and are they serious? Obviously it's never fun when it happens. Uh, but here are some questions I think that's important. What is the physiologic explanation of palpitations? More often than not, it's either anxiety from the patient uh, or the epinephrine uh, from the local anesthetic. Dwayne and I were talking a little bit earlier today, and he brought up the strong point. Are there any psychological components to palpitations? So, Dwayne, I'll, I'll hand the mic to you. When you see so, these, what, what, are, what are you thinking? So, if a patient complains of palpitations, I mean, you really have to kind of do an, an evaluation on, you know, their anxiety level at that point in time. So, I think a lot of times when people get anxious, and that's basically the, 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 the patients and the clients that I deal with on a daily basis, you know, a lot of a lot of what we can do um, is what I call talking them off the ledge. Uh, just just telling them that you know you may be feeling this, but then actually checking their pulse because a lot of times you'll find that the pulse doesn't correlate with them feeling like their heart is racing. Sometimes it does, um, but sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of what you may find is, is some of these patients may have felt that that little increase in heart rate because, yes, maybe a little bit of that epinephrine did leak into the vasculature and it did cause their heart rates to race a little bit. But a lot of that, once they feel that, it's self-limiting. It truly is self-limiting. And the reality is, is the patients don't know that. And they don't know that this is going to be okay. It's very self-limiting. And then you start that spiral of now I've already had anxiety about the dentist. Now I've got these feelings of palpitations. Now they're checking my pulse. A lot of it can be mitigated by what I call talking them off the ledge, telling them this is this can happen. This is not absolutely abnormal. Um, and I think there's a lot of psychological component that once you start down this road, that before you call EMS, 
you might need to, 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 to try um, and correlate that with the real deal. Just put your, hand, your, your two fingers on their wrist. It might actually calm them down and you can say, hey, actually your heart rate's not actually going that fast. It's actually kind of normal. Just breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. And okay. you, you may find that that will mitigate what they term as palpitations. And yeah. if and if palpitations are physiological, um, a lot of times it's you know a rapid heartbeat. But also, it could be, and you're never going to know this is it, they could be in, you know in some type of a um, a ventricular um, rhythm. I mean, people have palpitations all the time, and it's by Gemini, and they walk and they run and they do everything normal all day long. It's just that's the way they feel. Um, so it doesn't always, it's not always physical. It's not always psychological. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. Right. And I love what you said. Assuring the patient is likely to mitigate the psychological component, which is obviously tied to the physiological component too. You know, that epinephrine is only going to last a couple minutes. You know, if that, if that is the true origin of the situation, uh, it does pass. But there are times it continues for a period of time. And then the patient really starts to ramp up that psychological component, which can, you know, really start to have some untoward effects if, if it, you know, does start to spiral. Um, if the patient has palpitations, but their vitals are normal, what is the conclusion? So I think you just went over that, Dwayne. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, if this happens, maybe we make it a standard protocol that we immediately put on the, um, the vital monitor. We put the blood pressure monitor on, we have heart rate, and then uh, pulse oximetry. If we have normal vitals and the patient has quote unquote severe palpitations, are, are we comfortable at that point? Are we relying more on the vitals than the patient's subjective uh, rep recording or reporting of the palpitations? Are you asking me? Yeah. Um, I, so I would rely on what I see on the monitor. The monitor is not going to lie to you. Right. The monitor is going to tell you the heart rate. The monitor is going to tell you the blood pressure. It's going to tell you the oxygen content. And if for some reason you do have oxygen on them and it does sample end tidal CO2, you're going to be able to see them probably being very tachypnic, which means, you know, they're breathing rather rapid and fast and shallow. Um, does this, you know, does this necessarily, you know, one of the other things that, this may also do too is please just remember to keep in mind that this patient thinks they're having some kind of a cardiac event. They don't know what it is. They just know that their heart rate feels like it's going really fast. And we talked about anxiety. So if we now haul out the monitor, we now haul out the blood pressure cuff, we now haul out the oxen, you know, the pulse ox, there's going to be an increase and anxiety. Oh my God, what's going on? Am I dying? Right. No, you're not dying. You're absolutely fine. But because you said you feel this way, we're just going to make absolutely sure that you are okay. I think you're absolutely fine. However, I just need want to check. We're just being safe. But I think everything's going to be okay. You know, a lot of this, a lot of what I do in, you know, to get IV started is literally verbal anesthesia. Mm. And that's what a lot of patients need sometimes is verbal anesthesia. You guys do that every single day. You guys do it more than probably I do because you take care of more than, you know, three or four patients in a day. Um, and I think that, that, you know, tends to help a lot. Verbal anesthesia. I love it. That was, that was worth the price of admission tonight. You know, how long until these palpitations subside? You know, at, at what point... Are we concerned that this is a bigger problem based on the duration of these palpitations? Or are we? Uh, yes. Um, at some point, I mean, and that's a judgment call. I mean, should the epinephrine that we've possibly injected vascularly mitigate? Absolutely. It should mitigate within a couple minutes, with minutes or so. I mean, if you're at 15 minutes and the patient's still having palpitations, 20 minutes and they're still feeling this way, 
it's kind of the definition of insanity, um, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. At some point, you got to change your course of action and decide whether or not, you know, you're going to do something different sure. um, and, and, and go down that EMS route. Right. Um, I would say that if you're getting to that 10 or 15 minute mark and there is no change and it's getting worse, hmm. I would always err on the side of caution and call right. EMS. Yeah. Um, because, you know, because you don't have the equipment there, even with a regular cardiac monitor. I mean, honestly, this is going a little deep, but you're not going to tell whether they're having an MI unless you have a, you know, a 12 lead EKG. And I, and probably most of you guys can't read them, even if you could get one. And that's probably part of the other issue, too, is, is you only have one lead. You can switch it to lead two, lead three, and, and, and lead one on that monitor, but you got to be able to interpret what you're seeing. Um and and that's where kind of you know i think there's a that's the space that gets uncomfortable for people because it's not something that they were trained in right at that point i would say outside your scope of practice if you're uncomfortable and it's not something you've been trained in you're always better to err on the side of caution and call ems definitely yeah and that's that's what has happened recently you know and we always advocate for the safe side of things for sure uh, you can't get in trouble for calling it too soon, but you can definitely get in trouble for not calling it soon enough. Or be uh, or be being called too late because, too late. Yeah. Uh, especially at the, uh, is there anybody on here that's with the main board of nope. dentistry? Nope. Okay. So there is, in the last two years, the reason we had an issue with the board of dentistry in Maine was because there was a, um, uh, an, somebody on the board deemed that a CRNA called um, uh, EMS um, inappropriately and too late. Uh, there was no no uh, to, uh, tort, uh, you know, tort outcome. The patient went home, was eating ice cream, this little kid was eating ice cream, you know, later on that day. So there was no bad outcome whatsoever, but it did go in front of the board and there was a big to do. So it's hard, it's hard, you know, and, and I don't, ever want anybody to not call but i will say this you don't you're always better to be safe than sorry um especially in that situation because there's always going to be somebody that's going to armchair quarterback your decision when they weren't there right yeah and i think the more we talk about it the better better armed we're going to be to be able to make good decisions you know so that we're on the right side of the fence <clears throat> so what action should we take when this happens should a GP with limited emergency training know what to do here? Is there a protocol in place to support a patient when this occurs? Should a GP activate EMS when palpitations are present? Uh, what conditions should exist that support the GP in activating the EMS? You know, so knowing, okay, the patient, their heart rate is now above 120, 130. You know, we're starting to see deterioration of the patient's uh, vital signs. Uh, these are things that should alert us to be able to understand, okay, it's time. Uh, and one of the nice things that Dwayne shared with me earlier today was if the patient's breathing rapidly, their heart rate is elevated, and their blood pressure is, I don't know if you said elevated, but if, if you're outside the normal parameters for that patient, sometimes we don't know the answer to that, but I think we have to use a little bit of um, clinical uh, astuteness to understand, okay, this is a relatively healthy individual, you know, their heart rate shouldn't be at 150. Um, they shouldn't be breathing 30 breaths per minute, 40 breaths per minute. Uh, so on and so forth. So if we have, I guess we call that the triad of vital deterioration, that's definitely an emergency. But I think we should be and cog then, cognizant even before that happens. And it's very important for you to understand that, you know, that patient's norms. And that's going to, like I was telling Nick today, that's going to be different for everybody. You take a runner that's 45, you know, his heart rate at rest might be 40 or 45. And that's normal for him, but you that but somebody will you know a forty five year old with a heart of forty, eh, something's going on there, or the exact opposite, you know uh, a a child, uh, a young child that's you know you give an injection to, and now their heart rate's you know one fifty one sixty. I wouldn't blink twice about a heart rate that's one fifty one sixty after an injection. Now if it stays one fifty one sixty, that might be a different a an animal, but. Um, you got to kind of know your patient, I guess, is really kind of where know what their typical norms might be and go from there. 
Yeah, we do, we do baseline vitals for our sedation patients, but it's it's not something that's routinely done in dentistry for your average patient. But you know, as we start to develop these protocols, I think it might be something worthy of us considering so that we know what those are. So when should we activate EMS? Some questions that come up a lot. Is there ever a bad I, is it is there ever a time it's a bad idea to active activate EMS? You know, if you don't know, that's probably a good time to, to do so. This comes up all the time. Who pays for this service? I don't think it should matter. You know, if you're worried about the paying part of it, um, your head's not in the right space. You should definitely be worrying about the health and well-being of the patient. And if you can't answer the question, you should be activating EMS. But, uh, Dwayne, you had, you had made a comment about this earlier today. Do you want to kind of put so, this to rest? So, uh, who pays for EMS? Uh, basically, the patient will through their medical side of their insurance. If they don't have medical insurance, you're looking at, a, you know, a $600 ride-ish depending on what they do Best $600 um, or more ever spend. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and my, my philosophy is always, I'd rather eat the 600 bucks and, and, and let the patient know that I care about them right? and make sure that they're safe. than say, no, I'm not paying for that. You know, that's, it just is, it, it's not worth it. Nothing is worth your reputation. Right. Except for to have a good one. So, yeah, th there's all kinds of questions here. And as we start to build out, so the goal of tonight is to, is to have a forum where we talk about what are the, th what are the weak points within the general dentist's um, knowledge when it comes to this world? And that's, that's really the goal here with the ultimate goal of having very clear guidelines to, um, you know, we have a medical emergency plan, but it's in a book and it's text. You know, I like the idea of a flow chart with block diagrams where it's very, all right, the patient's here, you know, because when you're acting under an emergent situation, you want to have clarity and simple information. So having your help with that as we move forward would be very helpful. And then lastly, what can we do to prevent these things from happening again? Are there training platforms that can help me and or my office with things like this? Uh, I'll, Dwayne, I'll let you talk about that when we're done. Dwayne's working on uh, having a solution for this. There are companies out there that will come in and train you. There's oral surgeons that have this kind of uh, ability. Uh, the point is, the information's out there. Pretending that you didn't know something is not going to get you out of your out of trouble. You know, we we have to know this. What tools can I employ to mitigate the risk of these events? Having the right first aid kit, the right emergency kit. Uh, Many offices don't have the things they're supposed to have, even if they're not doing sedation. These are important. Uh, so this is the beginning of our, our algorithm, you know, psychological stabilization. The moment this happens, you showing up clear and very, very confident that the patient's going to be okay is the best thing you can do. I often say something to the effect of this. You can use it if you'd like. Um, I say this is not abnormal. I don't want to say this is common because that's not true. But this is not abnormal. You're feeling the same thing in your body when you go up a flight of stairs and your heart starts racing. It's common for your body to be confused when this happens in the dental office because you didn't just go up a flight of stairs or you're not running from a tiger. And I found by putting this running from a tiger, it's almost like a pattern disrupt. They kind of, they don't know what to think and they chuckle a little bit and they automatic, I don't say they automatically, they often get more calm just, be, just from that statement alone. So work on your verbiage when this happens because you do not want to sound nervous and if you don't have a script of some kind you use this you use a variation of this but have something in the back of your mind the moment it happens you sit right in front of the patient sit front and center so i put get front and center to the patient to give them assurance you're focused on them when we're, we're sitting behind patients they have no idea what we're doing we, we could be playing video games they have no idea when you sit in front of them you give them the assurance both consciously and subconsciously that you're there for them, you're paying attention, and you have their safety and well-being in mind. And then the body language of the other providers is very critical too. When it comes to the Trendelenburg position, uh, years ago I was given a medical emergencies uh, flip book for, uh, for the dental office from one of the oral surgery offices we refer to, and they did a pretty good job of when do you put a patient in the Trendelenburg position? I don't want to go into this right now, just know you don't put that patient in the position every time there's something wrong. There are times to do it and there's times not to do it. Again, we're going to dive into this at a later point. Just know that that conversation exists. And then what do the assistants do on the other side of the chair? 
you know, we work on, on this training at the office, uh, administering ox oxygen, the assistants know exactly where to go to get that. Um, th this is training that needs to happen on a regular basis at the office. And then obtain and place the vital monitoring equipment. You know, like Dwayne said, you should have some sort of script to let them know we're not getting out this equipment because it's an emergency. It's just because we want to make sure that uh, you are indeed safe. Um, you know, something to this effect here. So, hey, Nick, back to that last slide. A um, couple of things that, that any office can do that's, that's kind of truly cheap um, is a, a nasal cannula with some oxygen. And, and it, you would be surprised what that does for wonders. Um, and the other thing is, is you can get portable finger pulse ox that go on their fingers. That's not a big monitor and all this other stuff. And you could get one of those for 80 bucks. It'll give you the oxygen saturation and the heart rate of the patient. Now, with that being said, oxygen pulse ox giving you heart rate and oxygen saturation. That's and, and it being very small and very little, um, you know, it's people, it's not like I'm putting a mask on their face. Um, you would be surprised. Um, and the way you present that to the patient, you'd be surprised how much information and how much you can get them to psychologically stabilize um, with, you know, verbal anesthesia, a little bit of oxygen, a pulse ox on, on their finger. And it doesn't seem overly intrusive because it's not this big monitor with this EKG waveform and the blood pressure cuff and all this other stuff that may wind them up to make them more anxious and cause an increase in palpitations. So if your office doesn't have those kind of things, I would highly recommend it. An oxygen cylinder with a, a nasal cannula and, you know, a pulse ox. I mean, you can get all that stuff for under 200 bucks. That's great. Yeah, I love the idea of keeping it simple um, as we build out these protocols. Um, I think the idea of having... Uh, something more simple uh, definitely plays it plays in line with what we're what we're trying to do uh, just in the sake of time i'm going to go forward a little bit farther this is the um, medical emergency section syncope that uh, that duane had shared with me um, you can get these online they're they're in the there's a textbook from malamed he does uh, medical emergencies also the point is you need to have these as part of your practice um, at least for sedation. I know for sedation, we need to have a quite, quite a nice library of these. Dwayne, I think your document is, I don't know, 30 pages long. Um, because he does sedation, he needs to have very clear um, descriptions, signs and symptoms, treatment, disposition, so on and so forth. Um, if the board was to ever ask, do you know what you're doing? It starts with a good protocol. And that's what this, that's what this is here. Uh, I, w I did want to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, so we have epinephrine that gets taken up, but what if the patient ends up having a toxicity reaction to the local anesthetic itself? There's a conversation about allergies. We're not going to dive into that. You know, we should have a pretty good idea of what's happening if a patient has an allergic reaction. Um, with that said, this can happen and it's, you know, it could be scary. So Dwayne, you want to talk about this at all? Is this something you, you ever see? Uh, in the world of a dental office? No. no, I haven't seen it yet. And I'll be honest with you, I give more, I probably give more local, um, I mean, cause you guys have what, 20% light, like 2% lidocaine in a three ML carpet jet. Is that, is that kind of where, where we're talking about for a single carpet jet? Uh, they're 1.8, 1.7. So, so two MLs. So you're talking 40 milligrams of, of lidocaine. You're not even coming close to what that patient can handle as far as intravascular lidocaine. Um, we, we've, I've done, I've done infusions where you're up to, you know, two, three grams uh, of lidocaine IV. Um, so you're not even coming close. I don't, sure. I, I, to, for, for this to truly happen. Um, I mean, that, that, that's, it's more of a, I think it would be more of an allergic, allergic reaction. And, right. and honestly, even in, and in my anesthesia, in my first stick, I don't know if you guys know, but I put 50 milligrams of, of lidocaine myself. Yeah, yeah. And that's going IV. Right. So, I yeah. mean, you're, you're, you're truly not going to come close with uh, what you guys are given. In the world of local anesthesia, there's the, the 10 carpule rule, which is yep. a you know, very ballpark way of trying to keep, keep us out of this particular situation. Um, so I, I'm glad it's it, not overly relevant, but I think it's still something we should be aware of. Uh, yes, absolutely. Happen. I mean, because if you're going to, if you get someone that, you know, 
uh, I think a lot of it also has to do with prepping your patient too. Like we talked about, you know, when I used to, would do epidurals, I always tell them, if you have any ringing in your ears, any metallic taste in your mouth, or you feel any differently than you do right now, I need to know. Um, and it's the same concept because basically it's about lidocaine going intravascularly. I mean, I'm, I'm holding a 10 ml syringe of, uh, of it, 2%, but you know, it's still, and, and the first thing you'll see is, you know, low blood pressure and a slow heart rate. If you're giving a, a fair amount of, of local, um, and, and it is going intravascularly. And you may see this just because the patient's syncopal because of their scattered needles. So right. it, it could be one of those things too. One is gonna one of one of them one of which is gonna um, you know last longer than the other. Um, but I think sometimes if you prep your patients to hey you know uh, if you if you have any ringing in your ears or you know metallic taste in your mouth, I just need to know if you feel any differently than you do now, and then give right. the injection. Yep. Yeah, I talk about the use of buffers here a lot. We, we've had a couple Nikade sessions where we talk about this. The whole point of buffers is you don't need as much local anesthetic. So if anybody wants to revisit that, please let me know. Um, Zach, you used uh, some buffers today. What was your experience? He had to step into the other room. Ah, he went to bed. All he right. will. <laughs> Well, so are you guys buffering with bicarb? Yes. Yep. Love it. I mean, it game changer. Stings less, you know, it neutralizes the pH so that the, um, the local anesthetics in a, in a more active form, it really works well in patients that come in with a lot of inflammation because that inflammation is going to lower the pH. Uh, we had, we've had a hard time finding bicarb in a, um, platform that, is conducive to the dental office. I, I was able to find uh, 50 ml bottles and it took me yeah, a while to find those. That's all you're really going to find. Yeah. And even now finding bicarb is, is hard. I actually had to look for a bottle of, of bicarb just to do anesthesia in, 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 in Massachusetts, but it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, hard to find. I mean, I can't tell you when the last time I used bicarb a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I do see it becoming a, a mainstay of local anesthesia in, in the dental world. There are a couple uh, products and tools that we can use to to do that. Unfortunately, they charge a lot because they get the bicarb in uh, carpules, just like in the dental office, you know, in a dental syringe. Um, unfortunately, it's very costly. So we're trying to do a, a more DIY yet sterile safe approach. And the 50 ml bottles is working very well. Um, Malamed has a textbook, medical emergency, medical emergencies in, in the dental practice. There's other similar uh, texts out there. I advocate that we all have something readily available for us. If something happens, we should have the ability to either pick up the phone, call an oral surgeon, call somebody like Dwayne. You know, we should have a resource available to us or <laughs> several resources in case something happens so that we can have some guidance for those of us that aren't trained at the level of these other people. Uh, does sedation raise or lower risk of medical emergencies in the, in the dental practice? Uh, topic for another day, but in reality, sedation is a way that we can um, at least lower the risk of cardiac events. Patients that are more relaxed, less cortisol running through their veins, uh, they're less likely to be in a sympathetic state, they're less likely to have a cardiac event. So sedation should be part of the conversation when it comes to higher risk patients. So I kind of went through the last slides pretty quickly only because we try to keep this under an hour. Um, thank you, let's keep our patients safe. And does anybody have any questions for our expert Dwayne from Blue Sky Anesthesia? Uh, let's start with any questions. Well, that was a rough question. I got out of that one scot free. I just oh, have a comment, doing? Dr. Tebow. Sure. I saw you present at Yankee last year, and yeah, it was an excellent, excellent lecture and discussion. So thank you uh, for that and for joining tonight. Absolutely, uh, I'm glad you were actually there because um, that room was supposed to be packed with 300 people, and about 150 only showed up. So I'm glad you were able to uh, to be there. Thanks for coming. I think I think it was the storm. I think it would have been pretty packed otherwise, but yeah, it was yeah. really helpful. Thank you. I got a quick question. 
Um, whenever we're checking patients' vitals, is a wrist cuff sufficient for when something is starting to happen to pull out the wrist cuff, or do we go get the um, the arm cuff down the hall? I think your wrist cuff would be fine. Um, if they weren't if they weren't calibrated and they weren't accurate, they wouldn't be on the market. Yeah, and I think it would I, hold up in court. It would hold up against the board of dentistry. I mean, and they're not going to ask you how you took it. They just want to know that you actually took it. You know, I think the important thing to understand about those studies have been have been done to assess the accuracy of those compared to, you know, a conventional manual approach. Uh, there might be an argument of five millimeters of mercury difference. We're looking for very significant changes in, in vitals here. So even if there is a small error built into those, and I think Dwayne makes a good point that that might be in question, uh, in reality, we're not looking at the difference between 140 and 145. We're looking at 180, 200, 220, so on and so forth. Um, so great question. As long, question as, long as you're close, as long as it's close. And I would, and I would venture to and I would say if that that wrist cuff would be better, better than any manual blood pressure taken in the dental office. And only the reason I say this is because it's not done regularly every single day on every single patient in the dental office. So it's like any skill, it's perishable. If you don't do it every day, it might not be as good as somebody that does it every single day. And, you know, everybody's going to look at that wrist cuff and say, well, it was calibrated. It was a medical piece of equipment. It was probably accurate. And like Nick was saying, it's, you know, horseshoes and hand grenades as long as you're close. What if they're lying down? Does so you're gonna effect? you're gonna get a different pressure uh, lying down than sitting up, and depending on where you take it. So if you get uh, if if like on our children, we put the blood pressure cuff on their on their calf. Uh, it's going to be different than if I take it and put it on their um, their 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 um, thigh or their um, the humeral humerus area on their uh, upper arm. Um, it's it. it and in an adult, it, it can vary uh, significantly. Uh, it can vary significantly. Um, but if you're horizontal, expect it to be where, you know, where your heart is, is basically when you're horizontal, it's going to be pretty accurate. If you're sitting up and you take it up on your, on your upper arm, it's going to be, you know, your blood pressure technically is going to be a, a, a little different. So once again, it's about kind of being close and what's reasonable and you're looking for those large swings in blood pressure 60 over 20 40 over 20 one you know you know 180 190 220 over 100 those are the ones that you that you want to double check and reassess and that's the other thing is never 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 take one blood pressure as the final blood pressure if you've got an abnormal blood pressure, you check it again to make sure, even if it's with the same cuff, even if it's just, just give it a, give it 30 seconds and recheck it again, because it might be an erroneous reading and you never want to treat an erroneous reading. Right. I have a separate question. Yeah. You mentioned patient gets palpitations, lay them back in Trendelenburg. Uh, my experience first, usually I give local anesthetic with the patient laying down already. Um, not in Trendelenburg, but either head equal to the level of their feet or maybe slightly above. And then when I've had patients get palpitations, um, they typically have this automatic reflex to sit up. Sit up. Yeah. And I'm wondering, do I like, you know, throw them back down or how, how do I approach that? <laughs> nope. I, I literally would, I would ask them, what position are you comfortable in? Okay. Because they're going to tell you. Because laying them in Trendelenburg a lot of people are uncomfortable sitting on their head. I mean, truly they are. And, and if they are having elevated blood pressure, now what's going to happen? That blood pressure now is not evenly distributed throughout their body. That blood pressure now is on their, in their face, in their head. Now their head's pounding on top of whatever they were feeling before. I would say, you know, flat or slightly head elevated at, you know, 15 to, to 30 degrees, whatever's comfortable for them. Um, just because they're going to tell you what, what, what would be comfortable for them. My only concern would be is saying to them, listen, I can put you in a, whatever position you're comfortable for, but you have to stay seated in the chair. Cause the last thing you want them to do is stand up and have a DFO, a done fallout. 
and slam down the floor and hurt themselves. So just keep them in a chair. No matter what you got to do, keep them in the chair. Make them comfortable, but keep them in the chair. Thanks. Sure. Good stuff. Yeah, this is definitely a topic that we could uh, we could dive deeper into, and I, I think we, we should plan on doing that. Um, I have a pretty good sense that this is going to be a topic that's going to develop uh, some protocols for us, protocols that we can share with others in the profession. You know, in my in my time, there's often a moment of, okay, I understand this. I have ACLS training. Zach has a ACLS training. Uh, I don't want to profess for a second that we have the training that Dwayne has or in e ENT, not even close, not even close to an oral surgeon, so on and so forth. But I really want to put something together for the general dentist that's been out for a year that runs into one of these situations so that they can feel rest assured that they're making good decisions as this particular thing unfolds. You know, we're fortunate enough to have a large practice, so the odds of somebody being in the practice that knows how to handle it is pretty high. But there's clinicians out there that, you know, practice alone, you know, and maybe don't have the medical emergency chops. And they also might not have EMS right next door. We're fortunate enough that we have an EMS less than two minutes away. You know, so we, we feel confident that um, pa our patients are going to be safe due to that fact alone, not that that slows us down from making good decisions. Uh, but this is important, you know, and I, it's, it's a topic I've, I've taken many times uh, over my years of CE. But it is one of those topics a little bit like pathology where we don't use it each and every day. And what I want to do with your help, Dwayne, is develop some uh, repetitious recall trainings that are done once a month, every three months. We get a dummy where we do chest compressions for CPR. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've talked to people about this topic from time to time, and I, I don't think any general dentist would know what to do if something bad happened other than call 911. And I think it's in our best interest to be somewhat trained to at least set the patient up for success when the EMTs arrive, not just, I don't know what's going on, and just sit next to the patient as they're starting to, you know, a negative situation starts to unfold. So a lot of opportunity here. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for attending. Dwayne, I'll reach out once we're ready to, uh, to pick back up, probably in a month or two. Uh, and what we'll Sounds do is we'll, we'll continue the conversation with a little bit more um, granular nature to the conversation. But I think this was a was a great start. Thanks Dwayne. for having me. All right. Having you out, Dwayne. Thank you. And Thank you. Thank you. If Appreciate anybody, it. Have a good evening. If anybody would like some CEs, please message Julie at SockoRiverDentistry.com and she'll get you a copy of the uh, a one-hour CE certificate. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.